Hey, good evening, everybody. We will be having a discussion by Dr. Kavan. The discussion will span around the second prof subject, the mini test series. But before we do that, we all know that we have an announcement of INI, Institute of National Importance Combined Entrance Test. So hi, Kavan. Let me hear what you have to say about the same. Good evening, sir. Am I audible? Oh, yes, you're perfectly audible. Batao. So uh, I think the latest uh, notification which has come upon regarding the Institute of National Importance Common Entrance Test, INI CET, that is a welcoming move on my part because I feel that uh, because it is very tedious and sometimes exhaustive to prepare for different exams, different uh, set of important topics, different set of question pattern. Uh, within a short span, sometimes we have just a gap of uh, one week or 10 days, 15 days in between. And then uh, when the merit list comes, because the seats are limited, we ha usually have common toppers. And uh, then uh, even uh, if a student gets a very good rank or a good rank, then also he is confused because he doesn't know that what are the other rankers who are ahead of him or her going to do. So in a way, this is a very good thing uh, to have a common entrance targeting all the uh, institutes of national importance and uh, at the same time, a common merit list uh, based on the admissions, based on which the admissions to all the seven aims and uh, the three other institutes uh, will take place. So if a student wants to go to uh, Nimhans or Jipmer or PGI, then he uh, don't, doesn't need to worry about the different exam patterns, whether he's comfortable with them or not. And uh, in a way, it will create uniformity also between the different exams. Sometimes we have seen that the AIMS paper is doable while the Jipmer is very difficult. Sometimes PGI paper comes out to be difficult, but now that problem, problem will not uh, be there because whatever questions will be there, they will be common for all and common for all the institutes also. So uh, that is uh, again a good thing about this uh, system. And uh, the most important fact remains that a uh, student will have to give only one exam. And if he gets uh, a good score in that, if he clears it out well, his uh, future is secured. So I feel that uh, this is a very good move and I appreciate this move. Sir. I agree, Kavan. I can't agree. I can't agree more. In fact, uh, if you ask me on the same point, one exam, you can actually prepare for NEET. Your preparation for NEET is channelized. You will not have multiple interruptions, travels, multiple stresses, multiple prospectors. All these things are streamlined. If I look at your PowerPoint, the first slide that you have, it speaks that everything is interconnected. Now they have officially connected it. Yes. You appeared for need twice, appeared for aims and qualified. So it clearly mentions that you got good ranks throughout. So if you are prepared well, you can go ahead well. Second point, I get this meals very often. Do I write PGI? Do I write name hands? Do I write aims or not? It answers. You're writing one exam, all club together. Hmm. And that exam will be one go for clearing into national institutes, second go a preparation for NEET, yes. which I think so is a phenomenal thing. Now, without wasting much of a time, I will also like to tell the students at the end of the session, we'll be telling you about a good offer that MedMiracle has for all of you. Right? So yes. do avail that. It will benefit all of you. Over to Dr. Kavan for the second TND. All the best, Kavan. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So, good evening, friends. Uh, I hope uh, you gave the test today, and I hope uh, you could figure out uh, based on the previous uh, TN, uh, TND experience, uh, the discussion and the questions that how to connect the dots and how to think in an integrated manner between the subjects. So, today we are going to discuss regard regarding the second year subjects and the questions. Uh, so, we have already discussed regarding the INICET. 
so this was the uh, this is the first question that i have for you so basically here we have a 25 year old female patient who is suffering from migraine right and she is prescribed a serotonergic receptor blocker for last 5 years as a part of migraine prophylaxis right she presented to the surgical opd she presented to the surgical opd with the complaints of urinary retention and loin pain since a month they were insidious in onset and progressive in nature the pain relieves with micturition but there is a sense of incomplete voiding ivp image is shown below what is the likely drug implicated in this case now see you will feel that uh, this is a long case right and uh, so many details are given to you uh, the question starts with migraine for which a drug is given and then there is uh, urinary symptoms uh, and these urinary symptoms are insidious and progressive in nature followed by an ivp image now see uh, i have given you this question because i want you to understand two or three perspectives here first of all if we talk about saving time right in such long questions if we talk about saving time then it is very very imperative to find out one or two key points in the question based on which you can rule out the option right so here if i talk about this question the patient is getting some treatment some prophylaxis for migraine right now let us see the option ciproheptadine is one drug methysergide is another drug propranolol and amitriptyline now if you carefully see these options then you will realize that uh, okay methysergide can be used for prophylaxis propranolol can be used for pro prophylaxis amitriptyline is also one of the drugs for prophylaxis ciproheptadine is not a primary drug for migraine prophylaxis right ciproheptadine is not a primary drug so that rules out your first option this is not the answer right because there was treatment for migraine prophylaxis now another point says that she was prescribed a serotonergic receptor blocker now if you see propranolol you all know it is a beta blocker right and if you see amitriptyline you know this is a tricyclic antidepressant right which has nothing to do with serotonergic receptors per se right so you are left with only one option now that is methysergide so even if you don't understand any of the points from here till here then also you can reach up to the answer right so the answer is methysergide based on only the first statement based on only the first statement you can rule out all the three other options and come to the uh, final answer that is methysergide but i have given you this case so let us discuss what we are aiming to learn right now see with methysergide what has happened the patient has developed a condition of urinary retention and loin pain which is insidious in onset progressive in nature relieved by micturition but there is a sense of incomplete voiding and if you see this ivp image if you see the ivp image you can see that there is bilateral hydronephrosis you can see bilateral hydronephrosis and hydrourator upper hydrourator which is seen in the image and this image looks somewhat like this right this image look looks somewhat like this and radiologically this ivp appearance is known as the maiden waist appearance right this is known as the maiden waist appearance and this maiden waist appearance is a finding or an appearance classical of retroperitoneal fibrosis retroperitoneal fibrosis also known as the ormond's disease also known as the ormond's disease and this retroperitoneal fibrosis is a characteristic adverse drug reaction of methysergide it is a methysergide is a serotonergic receptor blocker used for migraine prophylaxis which is having a characteristic side effect of retroperitoneal fibrosis which will result in bilateral hydronephrosis and hydrourator 
giving maiden waste appearance on ivp so here we have tried to integrate pharmacology with urology with radiology right so in this manner i have told you in the beginning also when we took the session of important topics that adverse drug reactions are a very common thing which is being asked in entrance exams right and such characteristic adverse drug reactions are always a frequent target for the examiners so i have taken one of one such reaction and i have made a case out of it trying to integrate different specialities right so i have discussed two very important things here how to approach a case systematically second thing how to approach a case in a easy and quick manner based on which you can rule out the options quickly so if you just have the knowledge of pharmacology what is the which are the receptor blockers what is the mechanism of action and which are the drugs used for migraine prophylaxis based on that two facts also you can reach to the answer and if you know regarding this specific side effect of rpf maiden waste appearance in an ivp and clinical presentation of hydronephrosis then also you can reach to the option and the correct answer i would prefer and i would want you to know the topics in depth to integrate to learn integration but i also want you to find out how to get quick access to the answer right that is very important especially when you are uh, running short of time in the exam right so it is very important that you find out some quick clues and try to reach to the answer and uh, uh, take it from my side that uh, whenever you will have an integrated question from first and second year with the final year subject there will be such pointers there will be such pointers like these which are given in this question which will help you directly reach to the answer even if you don't know the clinical scenario right so these pointers you will definitely ex you can definitely expect when you are uh, expecting a clinical scenario based on pre and para clinical concepts right so this was the first question regarding rpf as a characteristic side effect of the methylsergide which is a serotonergic receptor blocker now coming to the next question next question is based on update right it is based on update the latest us fda approved anti tb regimen for xdr tb and resistant mdr tb right so you have to tell me which is the latest regimen which is us fda approved now see here uh, there is no logic per se because this is a fact this is an update if you know you know but what i want to highlight here is which type of updates you should focus upon now see tuberculosis is something which which was which is and which will always remain an imp topic for any entrance exam or for any viva or any professional exam right so for topics like these for topics like these whenever you have any updates whenever you have any updates they are of utmost importance they are of utmost importance rather than fetching updates of some rare and remote topics it is very important to find the updates of such common topics in the previous discussion also we had discussed an update upon cavernous sinus which was a very important topic similarly here the answer to this question is option c bidaquilin pretomanid and linozolid now see bidaquilin is a new drug for tuberculosis we all know and it is there in all the four options so there is nothing to think about it right now coming to the other options sutezolid is also a new drug here you have inh and rifampicin which are previous like old drugs which are used since many years here you have pretomanid and fluoroquinolone so these two options if i see it without knowing this fact i would be confused between option c and d right because fluoroquinolones are also one of the uh, drugs used for resistant tuberculosis right so rifampicin inh this all i won't be much concerned because they are used in normal regimens as well so they are not specific for xdr tb right per se these drugs uh, the when the, uh, when the tuberculous bacilli is resistant to the, these drugs then only we call it as xdr and mdr right so there is no point in giving these drugs for xdr tb so that option gets ruled out in the first place i would be confused between these two right and then comes the fact how much updated you are so basically this is the bpal regimen 
this is the bpal regimen which is the latest usd approved uh, usfd approved regimen bidaquiline pretomanid and linezolid right so this combination has recently been introduced for the management of resistant mdr and xdr tb right so this was based on the nix tb trial right this was based on the nix tb trial in the nix tb trial uh, xdr tb and uh, uh, resistant mdr tb patients were taken and this bpal regimen was tested right and the efficacy was proven in this trial so you can remember the name of the trial if you want so this is a brief information regarding the new drugs about of tuberculosis bedaquiline is a mycobacterial atp synthase inhibitor with a characteristic side effect of qt prolongation delamenid and pretomenid both of them are nitroimidazole which inhibits mycolic acid synthesis we know mycolic acid is a very important component of the cell wall of the tuberculous bacilli again the adverse drug reaction is qt prolongation which we have to keep in mind sutezolid is an analog of linezolid right it is a me2 drug of linezolid so these are the four new drugs which are uh, currently in uh, market for the management of uh, resistant mdr mdr and the xdr tb so you should know any update regarding tuberculosis that is what i wanted to highlight in this question with this new information right now coming to the next question so in this next question we have a 19 year old primary gravida patient right with a history of irregular fever not associated with chills and rigor relieved by taking antipyretics there is fatigue there is episodic bleeding from various sites along with purpuric rash hematuria and rectal bleeding also peripheral blood smear examination is showing pancytopenia left to shift maturation of the wbcs with significant number of abnormal promyelocytes right abnormal promyelocytes having characteristic immature bilobe nucleus and heavily granulated cytoplasm bone marrow aspiration image is shown here right and you are asked what is the most likely cytogenetic abnormality in this case now see again a long question from pathology and here you have to first identify what they want to say let us first look at the image so if you carefully look at i'll change the pen color for you so if you carefully look at this image if you carefully look at this image and this particular promyelocyte you can see that there are multiple linear rod like structures like there are multiple linear rod like structures and these are or rods right these are or rods or rods are a characteristic finding seen in aml right they are seen in aml acute myeloblastic leukemia right acute myelocytic leukemia in aml you are going to find or rods right so you have come to know based on the image that the question talks about aml right now that is again proven by the fact that the patient is having pancytopenia patient is having left left shift maturation of wbc and abnormal promyelocytes so there is a defect or there is a problem in the differentiation right differentiation of wbc and based on this problem now we have to see what cytogenetic abnormal or abnormality can this be so for that we have to understand this history this one month history of uh, fever fatigue and bleeding from various sites now if you carefully analyze this fact then this is pointing towards disseminated intravascular coagulation right this history in a primary gravida patient in a, a pregnant patient is pointing towards the disseminated intravascular coagulation now you have to join the dots here that which is the type of aml which is the type of aml which is likely to get complicated by dic right and if you don't even know that based on the finding of abnormal promyelocyte you can easily decipher that this might probably be acute promyelocytic leukemia right this might be an acute promyelocytic leukemia because predominantly abnormal promyelocytes are seen and if you just 
understand this fact from apml we all know that the translocation which is involved in apml is the pml rara translocation right the pml rara, rara translocation which is seen between the chromosomes 15 and 17 right so translocation between chromosome 15 and 17 is characteristic of apml and apml is uh, the one which is frequently involved in dic disseminated intravascular coagulation so we have multiple hints here in this question we have multiple hints if you can identify any one of them then also you can reach to the answer but it is i have given you wholesome questions so that you can come to know many different facts regarding a particular topic which we are discussing so we have an image which can help us we have pointers like abnormal promyelocyte we have pointers like a presentation of dic this everything is pointing towards apml and apml has translocation 15 17 right so pml rara, rara translocation so this was a case of dic right and acute promyelocytic leukemia is what our uh, bone marrow aspirate showed us right so basically there is elevated thrombin levels in this condition which leads to dic right so you should remember the other important translocations of the different subtypes of aml in m2 we have the translocation between chromosome 8 and 21 run x1 run x1 t1 genes right in m3 apml pml rara in m4 we have inversion 16 inversion 3 in m4 m5 we have translocation 9 11 in m7 we have translocation between chromosome 1 and 22 so these are the other important cytogenic abnormalities or translocations associated with different types of uh, aml right now these are some uh, important points i have just uh, made a table and shared with you so that uh, you can keep it for your quick revision at last right so in m2 with maturation you are it is the most common it is the most common type of aml translocation 821 chloromas chloromas is a frequent finding right chloromas is a frequent finding in m2 and it is having good prognosis in m3 in young patients it is having good prognosis translocation 15 17 is there it makes the prognosis intermediate or rods is a characteristic finding of m3 though it can be seen in m2 also m4 also but mainly ample amount or uh, abundant amount of or rods are usually seen in m3 dic is a characteristic side effect and artra or trans retinoic acid is the treatment for m3 aml in M4, inversion 16 is seen. Translocation 16, 16 is same as inversion 16. Mainly eosinophilia is seen and gingival hyperplasia is a finding. In M5, we have M5A, which is monoblastic, and M5B, which is monocytic. There is organ infiltration, again, gingival hyperplasia. We have increased WBC count fever, and again, DIC is a possibility in M5 also. It is also known as sweet syndrome, right? M6 is also known as arrhythmic myelosis or D. Guglielmo disease. It is a therapy-related AML which is having a poor prognosis. M7 is a megakaryocytic AML having bad prognosis associated with Down syndrome and bone marrow fibrosis is seen because of increased PDGF levels. Right. So please remember this Down syndrome is a very important point. Then another very important point is the DIC and uh, ARTRA, which we have discussed, chloromas, and the most common type of uh, AML, that is M2, right? So these are some salient points regarding the different AML in a nutshell. Going to the next question. Now, comment whether the following statements are true or false regarding the blood transfusion. So this is uh, the first one. So this is statement A. And then this is B, this is C, this is D, and this is E. So we have five statements, right? So the first statement says, the BT set differs from an IV set by the presence of a filter in the Murphy's chamber. This is absolutely a true statement, right? So basically, the reason for taking this question was that in pathology, the Central Institute exam, the primary focus is upon the practical aspects right and the practical aspects regarding hematology 
blood transfusion blood grouping these are frequently asked these are frequently asked so i have tried to uh, take one such topic regarding blood transfusion because it is frequently asked and i have made the statements right so these these are all very practical points uh, which uh, you will frequently uh, use which you will frequently apply when you will be uh, practicing as a doctor or as a resident doctor right so bt and iv set differentiation this is asked in second year uh, exams as well right in the practical exam second uh, statement says bt set should be changed every 12 hourly during transfusion yes this is also a true statement many of us might not be knowing this but this is something to be remembered and applied properly right because after 12 hours the the blood which is there in the bt set it will start uh, allowing the growth of bacteria and there will be contamination which can lead to sepsis in the patient so it is never advisable to use a bt set beyond 12 hours right platelet should be refrigerated until the time of trans transfusion this is absolutely a false statement platelets should never be refrigerated platelets should never be refrigerated they should always be kept at room temperature this is also another very important point patient experiencing febrile transfusion reaction should be transfused with saline washed components yes this is the true statement febrile transfusion reaction it is the most common type of transfusion reaction it is the most common transfusion reaction and it is because of the antigens present on wbcs right the antigens present on wbcs they are uh, inducing this febrile reaction right so for prevention of these we have to use saline washed components so when you uh, wash the blood component with saline these antigens will be washed out right and it will prevent the febrile transfusion reaction trally that is the transfusion related acute lung injury it presents after 6 hours of transfusion no this is the false statement trally typically presents within 6 hours it typically presents within 6 hours of transfusion this is a very very important point frequently tested in the exam right so please remember trally usually uh, trally always presents within 6 hours of transfusion in the first 6 hours not after 6 hours right so we had two false statements and three true statements right considering the important facts regarding the blood transfusion so bt set contains this filter is uh, specifically 170 micron filter right and what is the use of the filter the filter prevents the passage of blood clots and debris into the circulation right so if there is any clots uh, if there are any clots within the uh, blood bag then they will not be going into the circulation otherwise they can cause thrombosis into the small peripheral vessels bt set must be changed after every two to four units of transfusion or at least 12 hourly during the blood component transfusion to prevent bacterial sepsis right platelets should never be refrigerated as it makes them non viable febrile reactions are due to the uh, anti anti leukocyte antibodies against the donor leukocyte antigens right so saline washed or leuco reduced cells should be used for transfusion if the patient is suffering from the febrile reaction after transfusion trally classically presents within 6 hours of transfusion right we have discussed all of these points coming to the next question 